Hello, welcome to episode 464. On today's show, Phil Christian and I do a deep dive into George Packer's recent article in The Atlantic called How America Fractured into Four Parts. He argues that Americans no longer agree on the country's purpose, values, history, or meaning. Is he right? And how do Packer's Four Americas map onto the church? Then I speak with Kyle Strobel about his new book, Where Prayer Becomes Real. Obviously, the book is about prayer, but it's also about something even deeper and more foundational to our faith. It's really about honesty and how a transformative faith begins with being honest with God and with ourselves. And exclusively for our Patreon supporters, we have a bonus interview with Kyle Strobel that looks at the brutal, often uncomfortable honesty of the Bible. So if you want access to that interview, along with a lot of other extras, including early access to the Jesus and John Wayne series with Kristen Dumay, sign up to become a Patreon supporter today at HolyPost.com. We have all that this week, plus a new report from the Holy Post Science Desk. Did God design the Earth to destroy life every 27.5 million years? That sets us down a path into theology, the problem of evil, and why ferrets are bad pets. Okay, here's Holy Post episode 464. Hey there, this is Phil. Welcome back to the podcast. I am here with Christian Taylor. Hi, Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. And Sky Jitani. Hi, Sky. Hi. You had to, uh, we're recording the second one today, and you had to turn on more light, or your room just got dark. Is there a storm? Uh, it's getting, is there a storm going Yeah, on? there's a storm rolling through, and the lighting was weird, and my forehead was really, really bright because of the lights above me, so I had to just adjust my lighting. I don't have a forehead. I have like a 16 head, so there's a lot of surface area that yes. has to be dealt with. I, I like your math. We just had yeah. a huge thunderclap by my house. I don't, know, I don't know if you saw that. God is speaking to us. Yeah, I got an alert on my phone that says uh, we have a lightning and thunderstorm warning. So it sounds like it's actually fantastic. happening. Fantastic. And uh, Jason, Mr. Cinnamon Roll Rug is also here. Hi, Jason. How you doing? Good. How are you? <laughs> Good. Hey, Good. Jason, we didn't have... Oh, sorry. Go, Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I can't wait to hear how you're doing on your Cinnamon Roll podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, you made a cinnamon roll podcast. Yeah, um, unfortunately, at this point, when when everyone will be hearing this, uh, there's a there's a small competition for like super short podcasts about a, a random topic, and so I made one about cinnamon rolls, and everyone could have gone and voted, but I think voting closed the day this comes out, so oh, there's no no rats. help coming for me. <laughs> and you weren't on last week's show because we had Tyler Huckabee on, and we have te more technical troubles the more people we have on at one time, so we try to limit it to three. We could have helped you. We could have pushed you over the top. You could have been a contender. <laughs> I'll just have Sky plug it in the, in the middle part of the Oh, yeah. Podcast. Well, there you go. <laughs> That's for last week. <laughs> fantastic. This week's show is brought to you by Jason's love of cinnamon rolls and podcasting <laughs> combined for a I brief bet, moment in history. I bet with the size of our audience, we could totally rig that thing and get you in. Rig it. Yeah. Oh, rig it. Hey, Jason, well, you know, I just want to remind you, you are controlling the final result of this podcast. So, yeah, that's so true. technically, yeah, I also you don't can lose my job. You could promote whatever you want at least once. <laughs> and now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. All right, we need to talk about science. Uh, the science desk has been a little quiet lately, but there was a flurry of activity because we have some really remarkable news. Earth has a pulse. Did you know Earth has a pulse? And every time, every time the Earth has a pulse, it brings eruptions and mass extinctions. Well, if it's a and pulse, wouldn't that be like every second? That could be a slow pulse. You can have any kind of pulse you want to have, Christian Taylor. This pulse has been calculated to be every 27.5 million years. Is it? Wait a minute, though. Is That's it that? Slow pulse. Yeah, it's slow, but is it really that regular? Like every time it's the same amount of. Because it's disastrous. It, it, 
Sky, can I read you the story? Yeah, I'm already. Or do you skeptical. have to? You, do you have to be cynical even before you've heard the story? It's not cynicism; it's skepticism. There's skepticism. a difference. Okay. There's a difference. Okay, this is this is, here. This is cynicism. This is skepticism. Mm-hmm. I'm skeptical. That was the VeggieTales reference. Disastrous events, including volcanic eruptions and mass extinctions, seem to occur regularly. So regularly that they appear to be dictated by a pulse that beats every 27 and a half million years, a new study found. Researchers used improved radioisotope dating technology to precisely pinpoint disasters, including sea level rises and volcanic outbursts. They found that such events are not random, quote unquote, and appear to be linked to a recurring cycle of major geological events. Fortunately for us, fortunately for uh, well, you, Jason's podcast is very short lived, so it's not a, much of an issue. But for our podcast, <laughs> the last cycle was 7 million years ago, meaning it should be another 20 million years until we have another round of such events. So we have so time. That's, that's good news. Huh? Michael Rampino, a geologist and professor at New York University Department of Biology, says many geologists believe that geological events are random over time, but our study provides statistical evidence for a common cycle, suggesting that these geologic events are correlated and not random, including marine and land extinctions, major volcanic outpourings of lava called flood basalt eruptions. Um, events when oceans were depleted of oxygen, sea level fluctuations and changes in or reorganizations in the Earth's tectonic plates, roughly every 27 and a half million years, the Earth sneezes and stuff moves all over the place. Okay, so here's my question for Sky and for Christian. Okay, and maybe Jason. I'm not sure it affects Cinnamon Roll. So, how does this play into theology? It, any possible obviously if you think the world is only six thousand years old it doesn't r- really work well with your theology but a world that either sneezes or vomits precipitously every 27 and a half million years what do you do with that i, I don't know if you do anything with that that is a very unsatisfying answer <laughs> well what what are you looking for here Theology. I'm looking for theology. Is it some? What's going on in the heavenlies? What's going on in the heavenlies? In the in the council? In the well, divine? The heavenly council? That every twenty seven and a half million years, they they whack the earth upside the head with a baseball bat. Well, that's a big <laughs> assumption. I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure you can equate every natural occurring <laughs> phenomenon to a spiritual will. Oh yeah, sky. Yeah. Oh yeah. God gave. Print powers and principalities, dominion over the earth to reign for a period of time. So everything that happens is the heavenlies. Yeah, but I, oh gosh, you're opening up a can of worms here, Phil. I'm not sure that has anything to do with physical anomaly. I think it has to do with nations and peoples and cultures, not not the the natural rhythms of the earth, the atmosphere, geology, but volcanoes. The here is the a question. Pulse. Here is yeah, a, yeah, Christian. A, Christian, help me out. He is not helping me at all. Help me okay. out. So here's a deeper theological question. Actually, it's really more of a philosophical question. Do you believe in the watchmaker theory as a you know in relation to creation or not? Mm. So do that you God believe, started it, wound up a watch and then left it running? Yeah, that he created Earth with all of its natural laws and you know rules and he set it in place pulses pulses and it's pulses and you know it is here evolving and doing its business as he created it to and that's just part of his created order or do you believe that he is constantly intervening in the lives of men and in our physical space to cause us to wonder about him. Mm-hmm. Is I every thunder is every thunderstorm a call for us to turn our attention to God? Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, I think it's a false dichotomy. Okay, tell us I, why, I, God. They, because God can both establish a universe that is run by regular laws like gravity and electromagnetism and whatever, and 
also be a world that is in constant dependence upon the creator for its ongoing sustainability. In other words, the watchmaker metaphor assumes that God set up the universe, wound it up, and then stepped away from it and is disengaged. Yeah. And can and, I add to that metaphor? Can I add to that metaphor? Sure. It's not, it's not a watch. What we've now learned is it's a cuckoo clock. And every 27.5 million years, the little bird comes out and whacks the earth with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, but here that raises the other point, which is what do you do then with a world that sometimes does very destructive things, whether it's every 27 and a half million years or every hurricane season? You well, pray and harder and you say you're sorry for swearing and you won't do it again. And let's throw in one more confusing thing. Let's look at the Old Testament where God does, uh, where the old scriptures say that he is in control of mm -hmm. all things physical and he can wipe out nations with a flood or with, you know, mountains crumbling and earth shaking. What do you do with that, huh, Sky, huh? Well, again, this is where it's it's one thing when through special revelation, which is what scripture is, when word is given through a prophet of God's action, that he specifically says, hey, you know that that fireball that came down and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? I did that. That's fine. You can you can say God did that because he says he did that. But to claim any particular event, a volcano or a tornado or whatever, is God's deliberate judgment, apart from special revelation, is speculation. And that's where we get into trouble. And that's why Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, God causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. It isn't and that's a, a positive example where, you know, rain. So a negative a example thing. would be we have a tornado or an earthquake uh, and that falls on the righteous right. and the unrighteous. And he talks about this. I think it's in Luke 24. I don't remember the chapter, maybe 19. He talks about this famous um, event where this tower fell in Israel and killed a bunch of people. And he says, do you think the people who were killed by the tower were, were less righteous than the ones who survived? Of course not. So he's again, speaking of a random event and people assuming it's God's judgment, and he's saying it's not. Well, and so, that's also like in the New Testament, where the Pharisees said, you know, here's a blind man who sinned him or right. his father. Uh, and, you know, basically Jesus says neither. And I do right. think that you're right. When God speaks for himself or Jesus speaks and is clear about what he has done, then it's we should listen to that. But we shouldn't ascribe to random things, um, you know what God has done without him speaking about it himself. Right. But it does, going back to the original question of Phil's whole thing with 27 and a half million years, like what do you do with a creation? It's kind of the problem of evil. What do you do with a creation that often acts destructively, even to the point of causing harm to people? And why would God create such a creation that does that? And right. That's a, big, that's a really big question. Right. Do you have an answer for that? What is your Same. answer? When you wrestle with the problem of evil, what do you guys come up with? Oh, boy. You started this, Bill. Don't oh, give it the oh, oh, boy. I said the earth has a pulse. That's all I said. Did, did I, didn't, you... I didn't say, let's do a show about the problem of evil. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't prep for that. <laughs> Bill, you <laughs> teased it out there. God. I was just listening to uh, an interesting episode of Mike Erie's podcast where he talks about the powers and the principalities. He's kind of mm -hmm. digging into all of that and, you know, starting from Genesis one and going forward. And what does it mean that there were other heavenly beings? And that's what does it mean that they they longed for earth women? for the daughters of man and they took some of them and then you have the giants in the land and all that weirdness and it was unpacking all of that as you know and that's kind of where i where i said that um god turned over he gave some authority for earth to other heavenly beings and that's part of the reality that we're living in is that you know gave some authority to mankind gave some authority to other heavenly beings and there's been rebellion in both of those groups which explains a lot of why things are the way they are but i mean if you go down that route it doesn't explain everything because there is no. and john walton speaks about this really helpfully those rebellious beings, you might say, are bringing disorder into the world. They are deconstructing the order that God has put in place. They're, they're mischievous gremlins. But there's Loki. also... They're Loki. Right. There's also the existence of just disorder. 
at the beginning, did we just lose Jason? Yeah, uh, I bet he'll be back. <laughs> he just got hit by lightning, I'm afraid. In in Genesis 1, there's also just disorder. There's the sea, there's the unordered sea that God separates from the waters above, the waters below. There's um, separating the darkness from the light. And so part of it is there are elements of this creation which are not yet ordered, that are random, that are chaotic. And a volcano or a tornado or something like that could be put in that category rather than the malevolent action of some evil being. Right. Let's but, go yeah, with that. It depends on what you're defining as evil. Right. Um, if rain is evil because it flooded your house and, you know, your parrot, pet ferret drowned, that's might be a, a loose interpretation of evil. Although not from the perspective of your pet ferret. By the way, ferrets are smelly. We had three at one point. I don't recommend ferrets. They're smelly. They make your laundry room stink. Okay. I had them too. And occasionally they can get lost. We had one that ran outside oh, yeah. and was gone forever. And they also can bite with their big sharp teeth. <laughs> yeah. And they like to dig inside things. So you can get one lost inside your couch in your basement. True. And then he can't figure out how to get out. And we had two others that got lost inside our washing machine. <laughs> like underneath the basket. Not in the basket, behind the basket in the, anyway, don't get, that's what we learned from this story. Don't get ferrets. If there's anything you take away from this episode, God is good, bad stuff happens, don't get ferrets. Okay, what we need to talk about now is a story that we wanted to discuss a couple of weeks ago, but we ran out of time. George Packer, do you know who George Packer is, Sky? Yeah, he's a researcher. He's a researcher. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he wrote a piece in The Atlantic, which is an excerpt from a book. The piece is called How America Fractured into Four Parts. Uh, which is people, not about geology. It's not about geology? <laughs> nice tie-in, Sky. <laughs> Thank it's you. Not, it's not when the cuckoo clock goes off, God's cuckoo clock goes off, and the little birdie waxes with a baseball bat. Through much of the 20th century, the two political parties had clear identities and told distinct stories. The Republicans spoke for those who wanted to get ahead, and the Democrats spoke for those who wanted a fair shake. The two parties reflected a society that was less free than today, less tolerant, and far less diverse with fewer choices, but with more economic equality, more shared prosperity, and more political cooperation. So the, this is a very long piece. One of the reasons we didn't discuss it two weeks ago is that I opened it up and printed it out as a PDF and then looked and it was 47 pages. I, thought, oh, I don't think I'm going to read this right now. I can't discuss this right now. <laughs> so uh, he says, since then, the two parties have just about traded places. By the turn of the millennium, the Democrats were becoming the home of affluent professionals while the Republicans were starting to sound like populist insurgents. And then he, he uh, tries to break down how he believes now, rather than those two parties, America has really split into four different American realities. And this Yeah. One of the interesting pieces of this before we get into the detail is there's these four groups, but two of them reside more or less within each of the political parties. But those two groups within each party are kind of fighting with each other for control of the Democrats and control of the Republicans. So yeah. I, it, it's a, the explanatory power of his categories, I thought, was kind of kind of helpful. Yeah. So I'm going to give you the names of all four categories. The first word of the name should be kind of in air quotes in your mind. Uh, because it's more a personality than a reality, I think. And 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 what I found interesting when I finally got to the end of the article, I was waiting for him to say, which one is right? Which one is his group? You know, which one is the one he's promoting? And I realized by the end of it, he's, he thinks they're all wrong. Like they, he thinks there's there's a grain of truth in each one, but each one has been carried to an extreme. Would you say right. that's Okay. Yeah, so very if, much like my book with, which may be why I like this oh, article so much. Yeah, four. Do you have four? Do you have four <laughs> yeah. options? But yeah. you say you say there is a right one and he he is yeah. wrestling with the lack of a Well, that's right. because I, I go so far as to propose what the right one is. Yeah. Rather right. than just the four broken. That ones. reminds me of what Sky says often, which is there you know, we have to hold everything loosely and be okay with the paradox. Because when I read this article, it seems like there are positive things in each quadrant, you know, but uh, each of them in their selves is not very helpful. 
Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So the four things are, and put the first word in air quotes when you hear it, free America, smart America, real America, and just America. Okay. So as in, in a, righteousness and justice, not as in only. Oh, America. right. Yeah. Not as, as limited to America. No. I thought he should have called it woke justice. America. Yeah. That, that's probably more appropriate or activist America or, or something. Yeah. So, okay. So Sky, you, you've read the article, uh, mm-hmm. briefly summarize what's free America. Um, free America is what I think a lot of people would associate with Ronald Reagan's America. It's a very free enterprise, capitalist, libertarian, small government, leave me alone in order to make my own choices and run my business and achieve my achievements. Just government yeah. stay out of my way. Yeah, if you've, uh, and he says the ultimate expression of this, and this is where it gets profoundly negative, was people storming the castle with don't tread on me flags. You know, that that kind of the don't tread on me symbol is is kind of the ultimate. This is where this goes, you know, in the end, which is get off my lawn, don't touch my stuff, leave me the heck alone, or you're in trouble. You know, right. or I'm I'm going to respond violently. So, you know, on the on the reasonable end, it's a general free market economics. It's capitalism. Um, it's we generally, you know, want people to be responsible for themselves and not have government authorities at whatever level, local, state, federal, stepping all over them and you know and taking away rights. Say, yeah, who's not who's not in favor of that? It gets extreme when it becomes, you know, extreme libertarianism. And I see a lot of this in in Christian circles, conservative Christian circles. There's a whole lot of uh, Ayn Rand. There's a whole lot of, um, you know, the, the government should be small enough to drown in, in a bathtub. And the only thing that government should do is defend our rights to do whatever we want. Right. This is where you get kind of the anti-masker, anti-vaxxer, government shouldn't tell me to do anything even though there's a global pandemic. Right. So I've I've even had Christians online telling me that the government shouldn't pay for roads. You know, roads should be private. Companies should build them. You should pay to use them. Um, it's just taking this to an extreme of, I don't want government in any of my business. Get out of my business. Uh, so that's free America. And and there's a distinction between, you know, free to pursue what is good, free he even makes the distinction the the classic American freedom is the freedom to be able to participate in self-governance. To actually that you're free, you get to vote. You get to run for office. No one can stop you from participating in self-governance. Um and, and a more extreme version of free America is all forms of governance are bad. We don't want any of them. My freedom is to do whatever the heck I want and to have no restraints on me whatsoever, which is less biblical. Right. Would you, would you say, Sky? I would. Okay. Uh, you with us, Christian? Have you bumped into anyone that would fall in the free America camp in your, in your life? <laughs> Almost everyone. Um, I just want to say my father is coming next week. <laughs> I, I was thinking about having him be on the podcast, but it's my off week. So oh, I thought that would be kind of fun to introduce him. But yes, I just lived for two weeks with most people that would fit into for the free, free America. America. Okay. Okay. Number two, again, air quotes, smart America. Uh, I'm afraid I probably fall into this group, um, smart and not because I think I'm smart, but smart America tends to be people that have successfully made the transition to knowledge work, um, who don't work with their hands, who work with their brains, who globalism isn't harming it. If anything, it's actually helping them. Um, and where this goes, unfortunately, is that you know smart America is the America that has access to really good education, really good health care. The system is working. Generally, it's working pretty well for you. And you want to live by other people that are just like you. So this is where we get in a lot of uh, self-sorting into, you know, I want to live in the best suburb with the best schools and the best restaurants and fun bars and great things to do and be around other people that are just like me. Um, and so that's, there, it's an elitism that 
believes, uh, believes that we need to help people, believes that America should be a place, you know, that welcomes immigrants, that looks out for the poor. Um, but at the same time, there's a tension, you know, to the extent that it doesn't disrupt my comfortable upper middle class existence too much. So we can feel good about ourselves because I care about justice and I care about the poor and, you know, I care about immigrants. But the reality is if we have twice as many immigrants in America tomorrow, it doesn't really affect my job. (laughs) So I don't have to care, you know, that much. Um, And I, you know, so this one kind of stings me a little bit and I realize, yeah, uh, I think I'm in this bucket, not because I think I'm smart, but because I'm a knowledge worker and, you know, I'm good at learning and I have a decent education and I can make the system work for me pretty well. Yeah. There's a part where he says that smart America is cosmopolitan, embraces multiculturalism and is at home and welcoming a globalized world because ultimately you're not threatened by it because you have enough money and education to survive in it. Yeah. And for, for me, you know, a globalized world doesn't mean I lose my job. It means I have more customers. Right. You know, Good I can sell, I can sell my stuff in more territories. Hey, well, there might be Christian markets in South Korea and Christian markets in Australia and Christian markets in South Africa. And, you know, if I can sell Christian kids stuff all over the place. That's great for me. Um, then we get, so we have free America, very libertarian. Don't touch my stuff. Don't tread on me. Smart America. Hey, this it's actually all the changes are good and progress is great and everything's getting better. And I can work from home during a pandemic with no real disruption to my life and see no decrease in my income. Isn't this fantastic? But we do need to help poor people and we do need to help immigrants. And I want to, I care about that a lot. Um, as long as it doesn't really disrupt me too much. Then we get the third one is, uh, again, air quotes, real America. And uh, Packer dates the beginning of this. He says it goes way, way, way back, ultimately. But but the modern version, he dates to Sarah Palin. And when she was campaigning for vice presidency with John McCain, going to small towns and saying, you guys that were largely white, saying, you guys are real America. You know, this is that's where we want to campaign because you're patriots, you're real patriots. I uh, like it where he said she was John the Baptist to Trump's Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a it's an apt metaphor, really. Yeah. So, in fall of two thousand eight, Sarah Palin spoke at a fundraiser in Greensboro, North Carolina. And said, uh, we believe that the best of America is in these small towns that we get to visit and in these wonderful little pockets of what I call the real America. In other words, all the other Americas are fake America. She was a Western populist who embodied white identity politics, John the Baptist to the coming of Trump. Real America is a very old place. The idea that the authentic heart of democracy beats hardest in common people who work with their hands goes all the way back to the 18th century. Um, He says, uh, real America has always been a country of white people. Uh, President Jackson himself was a slaver and an Indian killer who uh, talked about real America. And he he called uh, his farmers, mechanics, and laborers were the real America. And they were the all-white forebears of William Jennings Bryan's producing masses. That was his terminology. Huey Long's little man. We got to look, I'm here for the little man. George Wallace's rednecks was his term for real America. Pat Buchanan's pitchfork brigade was his term for the real America. I don't know if pitchfork is really the- I never heard that. The, the, the thing you want to use to evoke your followers. And Sarah Palin's hardworking patriots. Real America has always needed to feel that both a shiftless underclass and a parasitic elite depend on its labor. Like we're the ones that are actually doing all the work. And we've got the lazy grifters down at the bottom of the income ladder. And then we've got the elites that don't do anything. They that just... sounds like the army's argument with the air force with, that are the grifters. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the army is the one that does all the hard work. That's yeah. Funny. 
He says, from its beginning, real America has always been religious and in a particular way, evangelical and fundamentalist, hostile to modern ideas and intellectual authority. So if you've seen my video on evangelical history, you know, that William Jennings Bryan was one who you know, ran for president twice on a platform of, you know, it's real Americans, the hardworking, the, you know, the, the laborers are the real Americans. And he then engaged it kind of kicked off the culture wars with his campaigns against Darwinism um, and modern theology, and which led to the Scopes Monkey trial, which led, and I think, man, the, the fundamentalist modernist controversy that he was a big part of has affected America so much over the last hundred years. It's, it's hard to underestimate. Um, real America isn't a shining city on a hill with its gates open to freedom nor is it a cosmopolitan club to which the right talents and credentials will get you admitted no matter who you are or where you're from. It's a provincial village where everyone knows everyone's business. No one has much more money than anyone else and only a few misfits ever move away. The villagers can fix their own boilers and they go out of their way to help a neighbor in a jam. A new face on the street, though, will draw immediate attention and suspicion. That sounds like Bell's Town in Beauty and the Beast. It does. It does. <laughs> Old provincial town. Good morning, Bill. But you can you can already hear how this how Trump's rhetoric was so appealing to this segment of America because yeah. he was saying the same thing. Let's build a wall. Let's withdraw from international agreements. Let's have a protectionist attitude towards trade. We're going to rebuild the factories. He talked about American carnage in his inaugural address and how we're going to rebuild the small towns and the coal mines and all that. That's all speaking to this real America segment. Yeah. So well, what, but what I'm confused about just for a second, yeah. when I think about the laborers and the people who are really, you know, in the trenches it it also reminds me of all the labor workers like who are now in unions and yet those don't fit in this bucket and i don't understand how they, they are did. outside the bucket they used they to are. they they well they are in the bucket now because there's very few labor unions anymore so you know remember william jennings bryan who was one of these campaigning for the little man was a democrat you know, he was that's Democrats did that first. You know, Democrats were the labor organizers first uh, and Repu the Republican Party became the party of big business around the turn of the, the 20th century. So, you know, this isn't about necessarily even left and right or Republican and Democrat. Um, this is, and this is where Reagan gets interesting because Reagan was classic free America. You know, Reagan was you know, the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. You know, we want the government to be as small as possible. We want to get, we want good, hardworking Americans to be able to do what they want to do without government interference. So that was free America. Trump wasn't free America. Uh, he, he was real America, where we say, actually, no, free market economics are only good for the rich guys. We want tariffs. We want protectionism. You know, we want to actually constrain the free market to benefit um, kind of a nativist uh, sensibility. So there was a, there was a tension within the Republican Party over the last forty years between the free America side of it and the real America side. And in the last you know ten years, and he he links it to. Um, uh, who's the who's the guy that was Speaker of the House? Gingrich. Newt, Newt Gingrich, Gingrich. Yeah. Yeah. When Newt Gingrich came in and declared that politics were war, you know, politics are war, it, just without bloodshed, and uh, we're going to take no prisoners, and and we need to win back the country from the elites. You know, that's where uh, real America started to win out in the Republican Party over over uh, free America. And and Christian, to your point labor unions, white working class, blue collar Americans were overwhelmingly democratic going all the way back to the New Deal and FDR in the 1930s. But in recent decades, Phil's right, the number of people in labor unions has shrunk dramatically. And even the people who are now vote more Republican because their primary identity is not as a blue collar worker as much as it is in this real America, rural America um, protectionist kind of attitude, which Trump really, gr they gravitated towards his message. So 
here's a here's a an interesting quote because the fourth one is just America, an America that's you know uh, very very concerned about racial justice, gender justice, uh, sexual orientation justice. You know, our, our social justice warriors. He says, and this is in a reaction to Donald Trump coming into power, progressives shocked by the readiness of half the country to support this hateful man seized on racism as the single cause and set out to disprove every other possible explanation. In other words, it, people who voted for Donald Trump are just racists. And that's all you need. You don't need any of their explanation. They're just racists. Uh, this answer, though, was far too satisfying. Racism is such an irreducible evil that it gave progressives commanding moral height and relieve them of the burden to understand the grievances of their compatriots down in the lowlands, let alone do something about them. It put Trump voters beyond the pale, you know, a bucket full of deplorables. But racism alone couldn't explain why white men were much more likely to vote for Trump than white women, or why the same was true of black and Latino men and women, or why the most reliable predictor for who was a Trump voter wasn't race, but the combination of race and education. So that's where it gets more uh, complex. Trump is a creature native to our own style of government and therefore much more difficult to protect ourselves against, says Yale political theorist uh, Brian Garston. He's a demagogue, a popular leader who feeds on the hatred of elites that grows naturally in democratic soil. In other words, since the very beginning of America, there's been a certain dis uh, disdain for aristocracy, for professional politicians, you know, and the notion that, you know, can Mr. Smith goes to Washington, that you could, if you just take an average good hearted American and send them to Washington, they'll do a better job than the experts. You know, that's, it's the movie Dave. Remember the movie Dave? I love that movie. <laughs> it's a great movie uh, where, what's his name? Um, Kevin Klein, Kevin, Ryan. Kevin Klein. Klein. Yeah, right. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, he happens to look exactly like the president, who's a jerk. The president is an elitist jerk. Kevin Klein sells cars. He's just no, an he average. doesn't. He runs an employment center. Oh, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. He runs an employment center. You've watched it more than I have, but he looks exactly like the president. And they need a double because the president has a stroke, and and the guys behind him don't want to tell the public that he's had a stroke and he's in a coma. So they hire. Kevin Klein's character who knows nothing about politics and turns out to be a better president than the president because he's a good hearted man. He knows how to balance a budget because he's a small businessman. So Actually, he, can... he brings his best accountant. Charles to come Grodin. Who is Charles Grodin. Charles right? Grodin who just died. Yeah. Who's yeah. hilarious. It is and hilarious. He also was a body double and would, in, you know, he would like be the president at parties and things like that. So he had right. some experience. Well, uh, yeah, he had yeah, experience it, it, pretending to be the president. Anyway, it, it, it's it, a it's a uh, kind of a fantasy of if, if you pick just any good hearted American, they'd be a better president than all the politicians and all the you know Harvard grads. And it's a it's a story we love. So Trump rode, you know, partly on that kind of innate distaste for elites that is in democracy. Um, and then, though, progressivism changed in 2014, and it changed with the Michael Brown killing. And, you know, as all of America started protesting and, and racial protests were all over the place, and um, suddenly there was a generation of, you know, young activists who rejected the notion that we've made a tremendous amount of progress you know, who rejected the idea that it gets, gets cause the, the author, uh, George Packer says, my generation told our children's generation a story of slow but steady progress. We said, Rosa sat so Martin could walk, so Barack could run, so we could all fly. That was the story in a sentence. And it was so convincing to a lot of people in my generation, myself included, that we were slow to notice how little it meant to a lot of people under the age 35. Or we heard, but didn't understand and dismiss them. We told them they had no idea what the crime rate was like in 1994. Smart Americans uh, from the smart group pointed to affirmative action and children's health insurance. Free Americans touted enterprise zones and school vouchers. But the kids didn't buy it. Then came one video after another of police killing or hurting unarmed black people. Then came the election of an openly racist president. These were conditions for a generational revolt. 
call this narrative just America. It's another rebellion from below. As real America breaks down the libertarianism of free America, just America attacks the complacent meritocracy of smart America. So smart America honestly believes, and it's an older generation, hey, if you work hard, if you're smart, you know, if you study, if you go to school, you anybody can make it happen. You know, you can make it happen. But smart America also knows its history and looks back and says, you know what, things are a mess, but they've gotten a heck of a lot better than they used to be on a right. lot of different fronts. Whereas just America can only see the negative. They can only see the progress that hasn't been made. And they want to paint broadly the whole country as this evil, corrupt institution that nothing good came until they were born and now they're going to fix it all. Yeah. So uh, he says, but just America has a dissonant sound for in its narrative, justice and America never rhyme. A more accurate name would be unjust America in a spirit of attack rather than aspiration. For just Americans, the country is less a project of self-government to be improved than a site of continuous wrong to be battled. In some versions of the narrative, the country has no positive value at all and it can never be made better. And this, you know, you can understand the kind of knee-jerk response uh, reaction against this from, you know, many conservative Americans to say, what do you mean we've never done anything right? You know, what do you mean we've been evil from the beginning? I, re I reject all of that. And then he talks about, you know, the role of critical theory um, and some of the anti-enlightenment tendencies and extreme uses of critical theory where you reject objectivity, rationality, science, equality, uh, individual freedom. Uh, critical theorists, he says, argued that the Enlightenment, including the American founding, carried the seeds of modern racism and imperialism. Like everything evil in the world comes back to the Enlightenment and Europeans uh, and then, you know, the tradition of white America. So he is finding um, extremism in all four of these groups, you know, from free America, it turns into storming the capital with your don't tread on me flags saying, I don't want any government regulations whatsoever. In smart America, the extremism is saying, hey, if the system works, if, you, if you're smart and we need to help other people and it'll work for them too. And globalism is good. It's not hurting me any. Uh, and we all live in a really cool suburb where we have great restaurants. So what's wrong with America? And um, real America says this has all gone to crap and it's the fault of the elites. It's the so we're going to take over the Republican Party. We're going to kick out the you know what we now call rhinos, Republicans in name only, but they're people that were classic Republicans that are being kicked out. Um, and we want to take it over and turn it into a new kind of a Tea Party, you know, anti CRT uh, rewrite history. And then you get to Just America, which is the flip side of that, where it's the kids of the smart Americans quite often saying, no, you're wrong, mom, you're wrong, dad. What we have to do is burn it all down because it's rotten to the core. Those are the four Americas that George Packer comes up with. And um, he says, we're having a hard time getting along because we can't agree on the story at all. Um, he says, there are just too many things that just America can't talk about at all. Uh, because the narrative uh, can't get to the hardest problems. You know, it's, it's everything, the criticism is everything is about race or everything is about injustice and there's zero talk about uh, personal responsibility. Um, just America also tends to be a narrative of the young and well-educated uh, and tends to ignore even minorities that are just working class, working class Latino families, working class uh, black families. You can so, see you can see in these descriptions how you can pull a a representative example from any one of the four and play it off of the others to frighten them, right? You can take an extreme version of just America and display them for real America and freak them out, <laughs> like this is this is what's going to happen if the liberals take over, or you can take the extreme libertarian view of free America and put them in front of smart America and go, this is what the world's going to look like when we get rid of all regulations and there's no elites running anything anymore. So that's what happens in a lot of our media is just pitting one group against another. And, yeah. and, you, and we come up with a, kind of exemplars of each group, you know, so the exemplar of just America is AOC and the squad, right? You know, if they get their way, that's the end of America. 
And the exemplar of of real America is uh, what's her name, the the Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, and Matt Gates, mm-hmm. and you know some of these new Republicans that rode in on the Trump train, Jim and Jordan. Just, yeah, and want to burn everything down, but not because it's unjust, but because it's you know it's calcified, and and we've got to bring Trump back in, you know, and then we've got smart America, and that's you know, it's the guys from the sub- suburbs that are so out of touch with the working class that they think you know globalism is great for everyone. We just need to keep you know supporting the whole world economy, and it'll all work out. Uh, so it's so here's a question. Okay. Did you follow all that? It's fascinating stuff. Where's the church? Where's the church in that? Well, in this article, it appears nowhere. Right. That was not George Packer's focus. Right. That's our focus. So well, what do we do as followers of Jesus if if we're looking at an America that now has four completely warring narratives at play. I, I think what tends to happen, and this is not unique to our time, but happens throughout American history, is particular congregations tend to conform to the cultural environment in which they exist. So there's going to be a church for real America and smart America and woke America and smart America, whatever the other one was. Just America. And yeah, just America. They're going to, people are going to tend to congregate with like-minded folks. That's not necessarily how the church ought to be, but that's how our churches typically are. And I mean, Phil, just talking about our church, I think you could make a case that there's a bit of a tension, even in our congregation, between what you might say is smart evangelicals and just evangelicals. Yeah. And and with a dabbling of some real evangelicals in there too. Like there you can feel the tension because of the diversity of our congregation on certain issues. Right. And given enough time, I hope this doesn't happen, but given enough time, it will probably end up gravitating toward one of those and attracting more like-minded people unless really intentional effort is made to not do that. Right. And you've got you've got Christian institutions, you know, like Wheaton College or hey, Campus Crusade for Christ where you know you've got a long tradition that's more smart america um or even free america well there's not a lot of classic libertarian you know ayn rand fans in in traditional evangelicalism um so it's it's you know it's it's smart americans bringing in the next generation and realizing the next generation has a whole lot of woke Americans in it, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, just Americans and saying, okay, how do we put these two together? How do we put together classic evangelicalism and, you know, this, this justice, this cry for justice, um, without making a huge mess. And I think there's a 178 page document at, at, uh, campus crusade headquarters that says we've made a huge mess trying to put these two things together. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes me wonder though, is part of it just generational differences and that will smooth out over time, which is a euphemism for saying just enough people have to die and we'll get past all this. <laughs> Isn't that what Hitler said? <laughs> no, but like naturally, not, not. Oh, of course. Yeah. That's what we yeah. meant. Yeah. 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 Like just it's, it's as, okay, as one grandpa. generation. As it's one okay, generation, grandpa. How are you feeling, grandpa? <laughs> As one generation fades out, another one comes, but the <laughs> tensions in the in the meantime are hard. Is that what's going on, or is this I don't know. something else? Because I I think we 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 swing to such excesses, you know. He, and he does talk about the excesses of what would be called wokeism, where you're afraid to speak because you might use the right term, you know. If, and if you use the right term the, or the wrong term, you might use the wrong term for the wrong group of people at the wrong time in the wrong context or wear something that you're not supposed to wear because that's not your, you know, cultural heritage, you know, and then you're just screwed. And, and the, you know, and I do understand, you know, that extreme form of wokeism, where it's like, you're now dead to us and there is no redemption for you because you use the wrong terminology. That reminds me, I was, I forget which hotel I was staying at on this road trip, some city we went to, I'm checking in at the front desk and there is a, a gay pride flag behind the front desk, but it's an updated flag. Have you seen the updated flag? No. So what is everyone's, the updated flag? everyone's familiar with the rainbow stripes, yeah, right? the horizontal yeah. rainbow stripes. So now they've added um, like a triangle on the left side of the flag that has additional colored stripes of black, brown, blue, pink, and white. 
So, I mean, they're throwing everything at What's this that? flag now we because apparently the means. rainbow flag alone, they said, was not representative of n- enough. Oh, so now okay. they want to include a flag that has black and brown for different racial minorities, blue and pink for gender, gender. And transgender people. Okay. And I don't know if the whites, I don't know what the whites about, but I mean, look it up. I think you could probably find it on Google, but I, I, I was just staring at this flag sure. going, hmm, okay, what's next? Like, what more do we, like, I, right. it's, it's that, that woke America or the just America is always looking for a new group to fight for. And I'm not trying to say there aren't groups that have been, haven't been marginalized and need to, need a level of recognition or, or, or um, care. But if that's the agenda is always to find new groups to fight for, then you have to keep adding more and more and more rules, representation, and it, it's just it goes on to to absurdity where you know people roll their eyes now and go oh forget it, I'm done where well, you're not right, winning people right. anymore to your right. thoughts or your ideas. Okay, here's my two cents. Can I give you my two cents? Do we have a choice? No, you don't have a choice. <laughs> the the church can't be any of those things. You know, we we can't be. We have to be biblical America. I mean, we have to be Jesus America. Not that I don't want to put Jesus and America together, but we have to be the part of America that's just. I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna r- respond biblically. I'm not gonna respond based on Ayn Rand or John Wayne, um, or I have to go through all of them. Or the old show Thirty Something, which kind of reflected. I really liked that show. I found myself in that show Thirty Something. I know. It, I like that. Yeah, because yeah. it kind of reflected the coming of age of the knowledge class, you know, in who was moving into nice suburbs and or back into the city and trying to make an upper middle class lifestyle. So there's there's I don't want to be that either, you know, and I also don't want to be so uh, you know extreme on on uh, justice activism that people can't speak around me because they're afraid they're going to use the wrong term and I'm going to cancel them, you know. So and also that there's not we we still have to have a story of redemption and there are some stories in extreme activism whereas no you can't be redeemed because you've gone too far. You've gone too far. So the church is there with a story of redemption that is for everybody, not any particular class, not any particular gender, not any particular socioeconomic status. There's a story of a a new Jesus came to start these little bubbles of new kingdom on earth. And that's what we're supposed to be a part of. And if we can't do it without making our little bubble you know, uh, to Barry Goldwater or to, you know, Ibram Kendi, you know, we're, we're, we're turning into things that are Jesus plus. If we can just find the Jesus, it brings justice. You know, he brings justice. He brings love. He brings um, just the desire to see people flourish. You sound like me today, Phil. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm motivated about this because, you know, I don't want to be, I'm working really hard to become more aware of injustice myself and to help other people become more aware of injustice. But I also don't want to go so far that I've turned it into, you know, again, the criticism that it's a new gospel. Well, no, right. it's, it's, it's part of the gospel if you back up and look at the entire gospel story in the Bible. Um, but it's not a new gospel. Right. I, I think what gets people hung up is when you understand that what Jesus' mission is and and God's mission through Jesus is to heal all that is broken and evil in the world, including us, and it needs to begin with us, then part of what's broken are the systemic injustices that exist in the world, including those that engage racism. And that therefore needs to be part of our calling is to heal those things. The fact that that overlaps a little bit with a hyper-progressive liberal agenda doesn't mean it's bad or wrong. Just as personal freedom and religious freedom is also something that is traditionally conservative that we ought to be in favor of as Christians because it also helps the gospel advance. Just because it happens to align with a conservative agenda doesn't mean it's bad or evil either. Right. So we, we have to stand above and, and apart from all those agendas. And where we're going to get heat from one group or another, you go, whatever, I'm just doing what Jesus is calling me to do. 
Whatever. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of heat from very conservative Christians who say, you know, you've abandoned the gospel and you're woke. And I've gotten heat from very, very liberal Christians who say, you know, if you're really clinging to the Bible the way you are, you're you're clinging to European theology and colonizing theology. I'm like, no, I no, no. <laughs> it's not all good and it's not all bad. And the it's Bible not, is not European, sorry. Right. Okay. So can I just say one thing or yes. maybe ask a thing? Yeah, Christian. So what does this have to what? do with you? No, 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 no. No, I think you made a good case for that. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I just, it feels like to me all of a sudden now in the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years, for sure five, six, we have really begun to identify ourselves and not just with the Christian nationalism, but by our political beliefs, not who we are in Christ. And our identity comes from the group we belong to. And I think as Christians, you know, I would say before that's kind of the group I belong to and I felt safe in was this, you know, white evangelical Christian subculture bubble. And that was a group unto itself as well. And I think it's really important for us to think about our identity in Christ and who he is, how he lived when he was here, the way that he sort of infiltrated all of the groups. You know, there were even Pharisees he, you know, reached out to and had relationships with. And became and so, his disciples. Right. And and his disciples. And so I really think that has to be, you know, our true north. And, you know, our identity needs to come there and we need to be different in this world. We have to be different in that way. Um, and that's an uncomfortable place to be because we don't really fit in all those categories, like you said earlier, Phil. Right. I don't, or I don't we shouldn't. I, I don't know if I fit in any of the categories and I don't know that I want to. Right. So you and a, George, a... you guys think alike. Who? Me and Oh, George. <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't. He never tips his hat as to where are you, George? Or you I just, well, he, I would bet. he doesn't want to be in those groups. Yeah. Well, I would bet he probably, and I would too, fit in the smart category just based on my education and and type right. of work, right? But to all that to say, though, I obviously agree with you guys. I do think the article is helpful for its explanatory power. Yeah. I think it helps make sense of some of what we've been observing. We'll post it on in the show notes. It, again, I printed it out and it was 47 pages long. So it's extensive, but it is fascinating, um, it, you know, and, and how, uh, how these more extreme identities, the real America kind of came out of the more conservative free America and, you know, the just America or woke America kind of came out of the smart America uh, to see how that happened in, in his telling is, is pretty fascinating. All right. Do we have a guest, Sky? Do we have a guest today? Uh, I hope so. Fantastic. I'm pretty, you've got me excited. You've got me really <laughs> I can looking, really sell it. <laughs> looking forward to the possibility of a guest after this break. Thanks, everybody, for supporting us. I uh, hope you have a great week. Keep following Jesus. Don't let the culture drive you crazy. And we'll talk to you again next week. Bye, everybody. My friend Kyle Strobel has written or co-authored a number of books, and he's back on The Holy Post to talk about his latest, Where Prayer Becomes Real, How Honesty with God Transforms Your Soul. Anyone who's been part of a faith community knows that honesty is often the first thing that gets sacrificed in a church. We tend to hide the truth about ourselves and our families. We live behind facades of righteousness, using the right language and presenting an image of piety that's often just a load of BS. Strobel argues that transformation only happens when we learn to practice honesty. And that's what prayer is supposed to help us do. So if you struggled with prayer, you really need to listen to this conversation. And what you're about to hear is really only half of our lengthy interview. We've posted the rest of it on Patreon for our supporters. So if you want to go even deeper, obviously get Kyle's book, but you can also sign up to support our show at holypost.com and listen to the rest of this interview. Kyle Strobel is a professor of spiritual theology and formation at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University, and it was an absolute pleasure speaking to him about one of my favorite subjects. Here is my conversation with Kyle Strobel.
Kyle Strobel, welcome back to The Holy Post. Hey, Sky, good to be with you, man. So I can't remember when you were on here last, time-wise, but you were here with Jamin Goggin, who was your co-author on a previous book called The Way of the Dragon and The Way of the Lamb. You've co-authored another book, Where Prayer Becomes Real, and you just mentioned before we started recording that you're co-authoring another book, <laughs> like a, a baker. Like, is this your thing? You only co-author <laughs> that's books? That's right. I do. You know, it's funny because in some disciplines, that's really normal. But for theologians, it's really unusual. And I, I do yeah. find myself in a weird in a weird space because I and I've, I've co-authored with several others as well, actually, on different things. And so, um, yeah, it's funny. I, I've had people ask me about that. I'm not I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure why that is. But I don't you feel it feels like you're a skydiver who's scared to not do it tandem. <laughs> Like you don't want to jump out of that plane by yourself. Right. Yeah, you I want someone else. On my own, but you know it is fun. I it it always makes it a bit better, especially when I find because you know how this is. You hit these moments where you're kind of dragging yourself into a pro, like you know these a couple months in or whatever. Yeah. And I find that usually my co-author has motivation and energy at times I don't, and vice versa. And so that that that's kind of nice. It's kind of nice to be able to hand off something a little bit and say, you know what, I can't see this anymore. You do some editing. What, what, <laughs> There not there that old proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That's exactly right. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And writing a book, it's a long, it's a long journey. So yeah, it makes sense to partner with somebody in it. I I bring it up though because I'm curious the relationship between your new book and a previous mm -hmm. book. So we had you guys on to talk about the way of the dragon yeah. and the way of the lamb, which was largely a critique of the popular way American evangelicalism has approached ministry. Mm -hmm which is more worldly in its ethic, which is kind of the dragon idea and not in conformity to the way of Jesus, the lamb. How does that relate to this new book on prayer? <laughs> and uh, it's just, I, I, I just wrote a book on prayer recently. It's not out yet, but I'm thinking of a stat I came across, which talked to, to church leaders about their priorities. Mm. And at the very bottom was prayer. It was 3% of pastors say prayer is a priority. Mm. And I thought, well, that's just the dragon right there. Maybe so. As you did that book with Jamin, did that inspire in any way this, this a broader engagement with the topic of prayer? Yeah, you know, this is a topic that you know, it, this prayer has been something that has kind of defined um, not only the work that Jamin and I have done together, but just my ministry in general. And um, and so this, that topic's been around a while. You know, the Dragon and Lamb book, which we actually just finished re-editing because we're doing the second edition is out in August. So um, that's that book's been in my imagination lately as well, but. That book was a sequel to a book called Beloved Dust, which was a lot about prayer. Right. And, yeah. you know, so going back to that topic um, was important, but also the idea of weakness and our, and how God's power is only truly discovered in weakness. I think you're exactly right about that, that, that prayer is one of those things that really highlights where our priorities are and where we how we view power. Because for most of us, I think, you know, we, we go to seminary or, you know, for like in my case, you know, Bible college and then seminary. And and what we discover is our our prayer life shrinks and our study habits expand. Right. And and we we kind of learn ways to give ourselves to things that I call good mirrors. <laughs> I think, you know, we're okay. all kind of looking for good mirrors. You know, that's why if you're a preacher, you don't spend a lot of time looking at the person that's fallen asleep. You spend a lot of time looking at the people that are captivated, <laughs> hanging on every word. And and so I think for many, prayer is one is a bad mirror. Right? You go to pray, your mind wanders, you fall asleep, you kind of go, oh, and on earth, you spend the whole time thinking about why your team lost in March Madness or whatever. And you you kind of just feel bad about yourself. <laughs> like, that was, what was that? It was awful. You know, it was terrible. And so in many ways, it's it's one of the key markers of the way of the lamb, that if you're giving yourself to the way of the lamb, you actually begin to value what prayer is because you're not primarily using the metrics of the world to judge your your success. And, and you know, my my co-author for this book is also my mentor. So that, that's a, a unique kind of relationship. But when I got hired in the spiritual formation department here, I remember the the going to the first because every every other week we have these executive team meetings, and the first couple I was like, man, John, like we have a laundry list of things to get done, and the way John runs runs our meetings is we spend about the first hour in prayer. We only have two hours. <laughs> We've never gotten done what needs to get done, and his approach has always been, yeah, but you know, 
are those things all that important at the end of the day? <laughs> like, I'm not, well, what's one of these things on this list isn't going to wait till next time? <laughs> and I could see that driving certain personalities it, absolutely crazy. It drove though. me nuts at first. I was just sitting yeah. there like, come on, Sean, we got to get this done. And it, th- I, I actually have come to absolutely love those meetings because um, especially in the academy where we we are so busy that it's hard to actually connect personally with one another. And this has become a time when we are just with each other in the truth of our lives, holding up our colleagues, spouses who have cancer and helping kind of um, hold up folks who are having this issue with a student they don't know what to do with and kind of entering in with one another in prayer. It it really has become such a profound thing for us. And, and it's highlighted for me that I still in my flesh have these temptations to just see the task, put the blinders on and just start getting things done. And the kingdom just doesn't work that way. So there's been tons uh, written and spoken of lately regarding the condition of the church in America, particularly the white evangelical sure. church. There's a recent study that came out from, was it Gallup, showing that church membership, church, synagogue, religious organizational membership for the first time ever is below 50%. Uh, people are losing their minds about the nuns and, and young adults leaving the church and everyone's coming up with you know, the strategy for what do we do? How do we fix this? And and there's, and there's some really good stuff out there. I don't want to poo poo any of it, but I'm not hearing anyone really talk about prayer. So I, I think that's exactly right. No, no one is talking about prayer and it's not just prayer, I think, but it's the kind of inner workings of the Christian life for folks. And I think one of the big problems is the average Christian finds prayer to be entirely isolating and lonely they they don't know how to navigate it their expectations are often just just wonky like there there is crazy expectations but we never verbalize it and so prayer is alone we have crazy expectations we enter it just doesn't feel like things are working it feels like i'm that my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and instead of helping folks navigate these sorts of things and actually help us understand well what what should our expectations be in prayer or what is the lord calling us into in prayer We often just give people ways and technologies to try to pray in a way that will kind of work. And it it just doesn't actually address where most folks are at. And I I think it's, it's prayer, but it's, there's a lot of places in the Christian life for folks where they just do feel isolated. They feel alone. I think of um, the conscience, for instance, you know, Paul will often talk about the, the nature of the conscience. And I, growing up in the church, never once heard a sermon that helped me understand how the conscience works. And of course, as a, as a person sitting in the pew every week, my conscience was panging <laughs> and I was navigating it. Quite honestly, that's most of what Christians are doing. And no one ever told me, like, well, what is a conscience? What does it mean to faithfully navigate it? What does it mean to respond to it? And so I think a lot of people are giving up on prayer and they're turning to worldly things that will make them either feel better or just get something done. And of course, long term, those things just don't have anything to offer. And so they they end up giving themselves to a mode of, of living the Christian life that ends up being fruitless. So it seems like a good chunk of the book is trying to uncover those assumptions people have about prayer and recalibrate them. So talk about some of those things that either we absorbed directly from our church or Christian community or that we just carry from our culture Mm. regarding assumptions or expectations we have about prayer that you think get us off to a bad start right at the beginning? Yeah. Well, one of the things I see that I think is probably just the flesh. I'm not sure anyone ever learned this from someone, but we all seem to just have it is, you know, you fall asleep in prayer or your mind wanders in prayer you feel guilty, right? So now you're, you're, you're kind of navigating your inner world a little bit. You feel bad. Oh, you know, I failed. You know, my mind wandered. I, I should have been praying the whole time. I was thinking about, you know, why the Lakers can't get their act together, you know, whatever it is. Well, then usually I find that folks then, because they feel guilty, they begin to try to kind of manipulate God a little bit. So they begin to, you know, profusely apologize, or make kind of empty promises to God. God, I'll, you know, try, I'll, I'll do better. 
And a lot of what's going on there is, I mean, there's there's several mistakes going on, one of which is that God isn't seeing through all of this. And so one of the things we talk about is we often put, we kind of hit the pause button in prayer a bit, and we begin to either talk to God or just talk to ourselves as a way to navigate our experiences. And so I did this, where we, I kind of pause prayer, and I'm like, oh, come on, will you wake up? Will you focus? What's wrong with you? Focus. And as if God's not just sitting there the whole time, but like, you know, I'm still here. Like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm watching this whole right. dynamic go on. And what we want to say is, you know, if your mind wanders during prayer, that's a gift. That's the Lord showing you the treasure of your heart. And the Lord did this with people all the time. Look at, just read the Gospels and just watch what happens to the disciples around Jesus. They just kind of leak out of themselves all the time. You know, Jesus is on the way to the cross and he's like, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they're talking about which one of them is the greatest. That's exactly what goes on in prayer. Or I see with my my seminary students, one of the things I see with them, and this is a more of a learned thing with them, I think, is that they, they'll come to seminary, they'll spend a lot of time trying to get the right doctrine of the atonement, right? So they're really focused on getting that right. And then that all gets thrown out the window the second they start praying. And most of their prayer life is them trying to atone for their sins. <laughs> and it's amazing to watch because they'll yeah. often turn against themselves. And so you get this image of like God's looking at them with, with, with like lightning bolt in hand. And so they're being vicious on themselves. Get your act together. What's wrong with you? And they're, they, they're turning against themselves, hoping that God kind of goes, okay, you've been harsh enough. I'll put the lightning bolt yeah, down. Yeah, it's the self-flagellation. Totally. Yeah. And so this is these crazy notions of who God is of who I am, of what forgiveness looks like, of all these things. And so now prayer has become a place to be good for them. And so it is no longer a place to be honest. And so okay. we're, we're targeting that reality. Yeah, and that's what you open the book with. Mm -hmm. One of the very first sentences of the book is, if you want a boring prayer life, spend it trying to be good at prayer rather than being honest. So the, that's the core theme that throughout is right. this call to honesty. Mm -hmm. Um and that, I, I was so glad to see you guys focus on that because that was probably the single biggest learning piece for me many years ago when it came not mm -hmm. just to prayer, but my entire Christian life. Yeah. That it, if I would just put down the defenses a little bit and the facades and be real and be, an, be honest with God, it would transform everything. Here's the problem though. <laughs> uh, for a person to be honest requires a certain level of self-awareness of self-knowledge. You have to be honest with yourself first. In other words, yeah, you yeah. got to know what's really going on inside of you. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm hanging out with the wrong people, but it, it, it feels a little bit like we are endlessly self-deluded mm -hmm. and self-awareness is in short supply these days. Yeah. So how can you really teach people to pray if you're not dealing with folks who have the mental capacity for self-awareness to begin with. And I think technology is a factor here. Sure. So what do you do with that? Maybe with your own students? Yeah. Well, one of the first things we do is, is kind of try to make it impossible in prayer to talk to yourself. Always turn to God. And so if you're bored, don't just realize you're bored. Tell God you're bored. Mm -hmm. If you're singing in church even, and you realize wow, I, I don't even know what song we're saying. My lips are moving, but my heart is far from him. Tell God. <laughs> don't just kind of reflect upon your life. Actually bring it to God. And in particular, the things in your life that may awaken guilt and shame. I mean, the problem with guilt and shame, which is, of course, what, exactly what you see in the garden, is that they lead us to believe God is the problem. Right? God shows up in the garden and, and Adam and Eve hide and cover. Right? They, they, they look for ways. And Adam gives that wonderful speech to manipulate God. And the reality is, I think for many of us, our prayer life is exactly like Adam's speech to God, right? It's a way to be close, but not too close. It's a way to wield our words, but not, not actually divulge the truth that God, your presence worries me, that, that you awaken anxiety in me. And so, you know, the, the way that we need to kind of shepherd ourselves, I mean, shepherding others is going to be important too, obviously, in helping kind of mirror the truth. But the way we need to shepherd ourselves a little bit is to just realize, like, what are my strategies when I see my sin, when I'm bored, 
when I experience guilt or shame or things like that? And are those strategies ways to turn to myself or, or do they ultimately lead me first and foremost to God? And then that would include in our day and age, you know, things that, that cause us fear. You know, are, are we just spinning into political or self-help strategies to kind of fix our circumstances? Or are we taking those directly to the Lord and allowing him to be a kind of mirror? You know, are my, my worries kind of part of folly rather than parts of truth? Based on what I heard of your answer because of the tech difficulties, the problem is, though, it, all of it assumes we are self-aware enough to feel guilt or shame or to uh, be aware of our distractions or whatever. And I, I, I struggle with the fact that increasingly, especially with you know, the tech devices we have in our, in our pockets all the time, like all that stuff requires space. It requires boredom to be self. I don't know if you've ever read Sherry Turkle. She's a MIT uh, uh, professor who's written a lot about technology and, and relationships. She wrote a book called Alone Together. Um, she's done some great TED Talks. Anyway, she mentions how loneliness, loneliness is a prerequisite or being alone is a prerequisite for intimacy. Because when we're alone and we're bored, we it allows all that stuff that's inside of us to come to the surface. And yeah. once we are aware of what's in us, then we have something of authenticity or honesty to share with another, another person, a spouse, or with God. But if we never have that alone time, if we never get aware of what's inside of us, then we don't have the basic building materials to connect with anyone else. And as she talked about this, I thought, wow, this is prayer. What she's talking about is prayer. Yeah, yeah. So, mm. You know, before we can run and hide, we have to know there's something worth hiding even, right? Like, and that's what worries <laughs> yeah, me yeah. is a whole lot of people today are so distracted all the time with all their stimulation and devices uh, that they never even come to the place of having the capacity to hide because they don't know what they're hiding from. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's, you know, part of the kind of design of the book is it was written to be prayed and so part of what we're doing is we're trying to shepherd people into those disappointments and those realities a little bit. Now, that assumes that people actually right. give themselves to it, right? So the prerequisite is you actually give yourself to it. But if you do, I think very quickly you'll discover, um, oh, my goodness, this is what's going on in my prayer life. And, you know, one of the things we do is it, we, we do, if you kind of pay attention um, and we were kind of cyclically moving back through the material because one of the things we found in our classes is it does take people several passes on this thing because I think culturally we, we don't have that watchfulness. You know, in early evangelicalism, the buzzword for prayer was mm -hmm. watchfulness. Like we are to be watchful. And that comes right out of um, Colossians 4 too. And for the Puritans up to early evangelicals, that was one of the most important things to cultivate as a Christian. Because it is that kind of watching over and attending to the reality of your life so you can actually bring the truth of your life into your relationship with Christ. And to your point, I mean, our current um, technology not only kind of undermines our ability to do that well, but actually kind of deforms us away from being able to do that at all. So a lot of the stuff you do in your book, as you said, it's it's there's a cyclical nature to it. There's a good uh, uh, kind of learning practice. It makes sense that you guys are in spiritual formation at a university setting where you are. I mean, there's just a life on life dynamic in a college setting that doesn't exist in other parts of people's totally. lives, right? Yeah. What does this look like in a church? Because, I, like I mentioned at the beginning. It, prayer is just not a priority in most American churches. And certainly instruction on prayer is not a priority. So what advice do you give to somebody who's not in a uh, a learning environment like you are, where you have access to these students 24-7 more or less, but are seeking to develop people's sense of prayer? Yeah. You know, one of the things we have found, and it is, to your point, it is hard because my my experience today is I rarely go into a church where I see church-wide we can actually embrace this. Yeah. But I always find a, a kind of remnant <laughs> of people who are just desperate for someone to meet them and speak into their experience and help shepherd them into a deeper way to give themselves to the Lord. And 
that that isn't that rare to find, but it usually is a smaller group. And it's usually people that have been Christians for several decades who are now confronted with the reality that, you know, early on I was really excited about this stuff and things were going well, but now what is prayer and what does faithfulness look like and why are things working out this way? And um, what does it mean to be a powerful Christian or to be, you know, how do, how do I do this? How do I embrace faithfulness today? And so we often find that when we speak about prayer, there's a select group that that kind of perk up because they're desperately wondering why, why has prayer become such a confusing and isolating place? And why hasn't it been what I expected it will be? And so what we find is that those people often gravitate very quickly, not only to this topic, but then they gravitate towards each other. And so if we can come around those people. And so in, in my experience, that's what we've done. We've tried to discover where those people are in the church and try to meet them and shepherd them accordingly. Um, and hopefully, I, I mean, my mind maybe ideally is that people begin to see and understand, oh my goodness, like they have understood something deeper. They have grasped something deeper and more significant. Okay, I know that interview with Kyle was shorter than you wanted it to be, but our new segment went pretty long this week. The good news is that you can hear the rest of my conversation with Kyle Strobel if you're a Patreon supporter. And if you're not, you can become one by going to holypost.com and hitting the support us link at the top of the page. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your support. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more.